This is a video to lay the groundwork for an assignment on sizing steel beams using tables. This is from chapter 6, section 3, subsection 3, and this is actually a video which is outside the sequence of everything we've done before. So it's video D and it's specifically related to an assignment to size the joist or secondary beams and primary beams in a steel frame system where the columns are set on a 42 foot by 42 foot grid. So this is what it looks like in the framing plan. This is a column, there's a column, there's a column, here's a column and so forth. So the spacing between columns in this direction is 42 feet and the spacing is 42 feet in this direction. In the process of working this problem, we're going to set up a spreadsheet and that spreadsheet will reflect this 42 foot joist spacing or joist length rather. So here's a joist that's spanning 42 feet and a 42 foot span for the girders. But the spreadsheet will be in the form of a template, so in fact it could be applied in the future to a situation of different span for both the girders and the joists, or we might have um, meaning different from this particular problem and different from the 42 feet, or we might actually have a different joist length, which is, excuse me, in this direction, versus the girder length. So it'll be a very generalized template, but for the moment we're going to deal with this 42 foot by 42 foot column grid. So you'll notice the width of the floor area or the floor strip, which is carried by this joist is six feet. And likewise, this joist will have a six foot floor area associated with it. This perimeter girder supports halfway over to the next girder. So it spans or supports a, a width of floor that's 21 feet wide. And of course, 42 feet long. In the case of this interior girder, it's spanning halfway to each of the adjacent girders, or in other words, it's supporting a width of floor that's 42 feet. Uh, as we mentioned previously, the stress capacity of steel is so high that we customarily don't even need to check it for normal architectural applications. So in the case of wood, we checked shear capacity, moment capacity, and stiffness. In the case of steel, we're only going to check moment capacity and stiffness because if the loads are not extraordinarily high, the shear forces are never high enough that that's the classic mode of failure. Now, in the, in the case of wood, we started through and we checked for shear and then we checked for moment and then we check for stiffness. In the case of steel, we're going to only have to worry about moment capacity and stiffness, and we're going to reverse the order at which we look at those things. So we're actually going to account for stiffness first and then moment capacity. The reason we do that is the stiffness criterion is based only on live load. So whatever the weight of the beam is that we determine, we do not have to iterate on that for purposes of satisfying the stiffness condition. In other words, the stiffness condition, which is analyzed or calculated based on the live load, will never change. We do it once and it's done, and it provides an input which is helpful to us in terms of getting in the ballpark for then doing the check of the moment capacity. So we're going to determine some estimated weight of the beam based on the stiffness criterion and the stiffness sizing procedure, and that will become input to our moment capacity 
calculation. So consistent with that, we have the following equation. Delta max is equal to 5 W live L to the fourth over 384 EI. So W is the live load distributed along the beam in pounds per foot or kips per foot. L is the span of the beam. In this case, of course, we're using this formula because it's the formula for a simple span beam. We need to understand that when we start this process. And in fact, the, the uh, framing plan that we began with, you'll notice these sort of gaps that are shown. This is the graphic technique to suggest that that's a pin joint. <clears throat> we have a gap on both the girders and the joist, which says that they are behaving as simple span beams with uh, pin joints at the end. So we have simple span beams. We have delta max is equal to 5W live L to the fourth over 384 EI. L is the span, E is the material stiffness, and I is the cross-sectional stiffness for which the technical term is moment of inertia. We can take this expression and transpose I and delta max. So we get I is equal to 5WL to the fourth over 384E delta, where delta is the maximum deflection along the length of this beam. <clears throat> now, we can set some maximum deflection based on sort of commonly accepted perceptual responses. So we'd like for the deflection not to become too large that it becomes disturbing to people. We have a sense of what that is and typically the deflection should be less than or equal to L over 360. So we can figure out what delta max is from that and then calculate I required to keep the deflection below that limit. So this is a minimum I and we can have some greater stiffness, some greater cross-sectional stiffness, but we need to meet this requirement. Now we're going to rearrange this expression. We're going to take one of these L's out and couple it with this delta max. So in other words, instead of L to the fourth, we're going to have L cubed times L. And this L we're going to mix with this delta max to produce this ratio. And that ratio, by the way, is the way in which we usually express the limit on the deflection. It's not an absolute limit. It's a limit as a ratio or a proportion to the length. And the one we've been typically using is L over delta um, is 360. So we have replaced this ratio with the number 360. We're left with the L cubed and 384E in the denominator. So now we plug into this equation some typical numbers. We have 5. And then for W live, we could have something in kips per foot, such as 0.12 kips per foot. And it turns out that's the first uh, live load that we're going to deal with on the roof joists. And we'll show shortly where that came from. But first of all, I want to um, run through these numbers and more importantly, run through the manipulation of the units so we're sure that we know what we're doing. So the length is going to be 42 feet to the third power. And then of course we have this 360. So L cubed is that, W live is that, 360 is here. And then for 384E, the material stiffness for steel is 29,000 kips per square inch. So we have this expression, and before we can proceed, we have to clean up the units. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get this complex thing gone in the, in the, numerator, in the denominator, where we have a denominator in the denominator, and this, this is inches squared. So to clean it up, we're going to multiply the denominator of this expression by inches squared, which will cancel that out. To keep the mathematics legitimate, that means we also have to multiply the numerator by inches squared. 
So this inches squared cancels that out, but then we're left with inches squared in the numerator. Also in the numerator, we have feet cubed over feet, which is feet squared. So we have feet squared times inches squared, and we don't normally want to operate in mixed units like that. And where cross sections are concerned, we always use inches instead of feet. So we're going to convert all these uh, spare feet up here into inches by multiplying by 12 inches per foot times 12 inches per foot. And that converts everything in the numerator. This foot cancels out one of those. That foot cancels out one of those. This foot cancels out one of those. And we're left with inches squared times inches times inches, um, which gives us inches to the fourth. So the final answer here is 207 inches to the fourth. Now, the important thing here is we have introduced, because of this conversion issue, which is part of what we're doing to clean up and organize the units, we've introduced a factor of 12 there and a factor of 12 there, or in other words, a factor of 144 to make the units come out to something sensible. So this is where we issue you a warning. Excel will never get your units correct for you. You can't just start plugging numbers into Excel and hope you're going to get the right answer because if you did that and you just plugged in that number and 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 you didn't make these conversions you will be off by a factor of 144. That's a major error. Excel will not get your units correct for you. It will not even suggest to you that that's anything you need to worry about because Excel was not designed to do that. Excel was designed to multiply and divide and add and subtract numbers and do other kinds of mathematical manipulations, but it does not do units. So you have to work out the units beforehand and incorporate the appropriate conversions in the equations that you input to Excel. <clears throat> so having said that, we're gonna jump to our spreadsheet and I want to move this down a little bit so we make sure that you can see everything I want you to see. So you should see your formula bar up above. And um, you'll notice in this spreadsheet there are two categories you can see. One is load and span information, which is all of this stuff right here. And then there's sizing for stiffness which is everything in here. And eventually we're going to uh, scroll to the right and you're going to see that there's a section uh, for sizing uh, for moment strength. And we will get to that uh, eventually, but keep in mind that we are sizing first for stiffness because it's a non-iterative process, we do it once and it's done. Whereas we might have to iterate on this moment, moment strength because we'll size for moment strength, which involves all the dead loads. Then we'll calculate the new dead load for the beam. And we may discover that the new dead load, load for the beam inches us up above some acceptable number. And then we have to redesign the beam again because the self-weight of the beam has made its sizing ir um, not legitimate or irrelevant. Okay, so here we have our spreadsheet. We have roof joist, single loaded roof girder, double loaded roof girder. Here we have the beam span. So for the joist, it's 42 feet. For the single loaded roof girder, it's 42. And for the double loaded roof girder, it's 42. And all three of those numbers were put in um, as bold blue numbers, which means uh, those are inputs that you can change to make this template that you're going to create apply to some other uh, span configurations. Now, here we have the beam spacing, S in feet. The joists have got to be spaced at some kind of an interval that is an as an integer subdivider of the girder length. 
In other words, the girders, the single loaded and double loaded girders are supporting the joist and we'd like to, for the joist to be equally spaced along the top of the girder. And the way we go about doing that is we subdivide the length of the girder by some integer. In this case, I said, well, 42 right here divided by seven gives us six. So I put in six feet for the spacing of the joist. And by the way, uh, that was reflected back here where we did this uh, uh, floor framing plan. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spaces of six foot length. Now, the width of floor supported by a single loaded roof girder is 21 feet. And again, we go back to this image and we say that girder supports halfway to that girder and that width of floor is 21 feet. And then for the interior girder, we said the width of floor is 42. So for our calculational purposes, that becomes our S. So here we put 21 feet, which by the way is equal to B19 over two. In other words, it's spanning, it's a supporting width of floor, this half of the length of a joist. In the case of the interior girder, it's just equal to the length of the joist. So that's cell B19, which is the span or length of a joist. Okay, so we're initially starting off with roofing loads. Uh, we're going to do 20 pounds a square foot of dead load, 20 pounds a square foot of live load. Um, I'm going to scroll down a little bit and say that for this particular exercise, our floor loads are going to be 53 pounds a square foot of, of the dead load of the concrete decking and corrugated steel decking and 80 pounds a square foot of live load. So this would be appropriate to an office where none of the space that we're designing is specified as card or space. If it was card or space, it would be 100 pounds a square foot. Okay, but right now we're going to mainly focus on the roof where we have a dead load of 20 pounds a square foot and a live load of 20 pounds a square foot. So now we're going to calculate some line distributed loads W dead and W live. And here you'll notice I've incorporated this formula into the spreadsheet that says W dead is equal to the area distributed dead load P sub dead times the spacing between those joists. And then I've also incorporated a conversion factor to convert from pounds to kips. And the reason I like to do that fairly early on is, first of all, we know that the loads are going to get large enough that eventually we're going to want to express them in kips. But more importantly, we have software that's commonly used to do structural analysis, and we're going to have a foray into that subject matter soon. And that software that we use in this course is called Multiframe, and it only takes loads in kips. If you calculate loads in pounds and then put that number in, it will interpret it as kips, in which case you will be saying to the computer program that you have a thousand times more load on there than is your intention. So being systematic and always making that conversion early is a way to avoid confusion. Okay, so W is equal to P dead times S uh, with a conversion factor of kips one kip per thousand pounds. So I look at this formula and I see this is the formula for the input cell. So you see it up here in the formula bar. It says that it's C19, which is the spacing, times D19, which is the area distributed dead load. So in other words, that's S times P dead. And then we have divided by a thousand to convert it to kips. When we go here, we see it's the spacing C19 times E19, which is the area distributed live load. And again, we've divided by a thousand up here to get it into kips per foot. When we do the dead load for the single loaded girder, 
it turns out that it's equal to this spacing of 21 feet times this load of 20 pounds per square foot and then we divide by a thousand again to get it into kips per foot and then here we have uh, C22 which is the spacing times the live load which is E22. Let me go down here and we have the line distributed load along the double loaded or interior roof girder is going to equal this spacing which turns out to be the length of the roof joist and this girder supports 21 feet on each side to get it halfway to the next girder so the width of roof that's being supported is 42 feet so that's the spacing um, right here rather so it's just equal to B19 so when I go to this formula it says uh, C25 which is this number right here times D25 which is the area distributed dead load and when I go here it's just this width of floor or ceiling roof rather times the live load of 20 pounds a square foot. So that's how we get all the W deads and the W lives for each of these um, beams in the roof. Okay, so here we have our formula. 5W live times L cubed times 360 over 384, which is 384E, which is basically this formula right here that we just talked about. So we're going to go apply that formula where W live is now going to be that figure right there and we're going to multiply that times L cubed. So here we have 5G19 which is this number right here which is the live load times B19 which is the length of the joist to the third power times our 360 which is our deflection criterion times 144 which is our conversion factor divided by 384 times 29,000 where 29,000 kips per square inch is the stiffness of the steel. So when we want to run all those numbers we get 270 inches to the fourth. We have a similar formula down here which is based on exactly the same principle and is picking up all the correct cells. So G22 is the live load. Uh, B22 is the length of the single loaded girder and that's cubed times our deflection factor times our conversion factor and so forth. And then we do a similar formula down here. All those are done in an identical way. <clears throat> so what this says is we need at least 207 inches to the fourth to satisfy our stiffness criterion for the roof joist. Now we have to find a section that satisfies that. So we're going to go to this table <clears throat> which contains our moments of inertia <clears throat> or in other words our cross-sectional stiffnesses. So this table is for I sub X which is the moment of inertia calculated around the strong direction which is the way in which the beam is oriented in order to work most effectively. Um, and again the moment of inertia is the cross-sectional stiffness and we said we were looking for 207 so I'm going to go uh, to the lower end of this <clears throat> and you'll notice I'm starting here at a W10 by 12 which is the lightest section that they provide as a beam so here you have shape and we're going up here to progressively heavier and deeper sections and then here we go continue up <coughs> to deeper and deeper sections and we keep going like that. <coughs> so here you have shape 
there you have moment of inertia in inches to the fourth. Here you have shape and moment of inertia to inches to the fourth. And shape and moment of inertia in units of inches to the fourth. So we're starting down here at very low numbers and we're going up and we're looking for 207. So we arrive at 204, which is the W12 by 26. Now, most people would look at this deflection issue and say it's perceptual. 204 is almost 207. And we're probably going to get some additional stiffness from the decking, which we haven't calculated or accounted for. And so they would settle for this 204. For the purposes of this class, though, we're just going to have this simple rule. We're always going to find one that works. <clears throat> that's greater than or equal to what we were targeting. So let me remind you of one thing in this table. You'll notice things are grouped together. Everything within this grouping, this is the stiffest one is at the top. It also happens to be not only stiffer, but lighter than any of the rest of them. So here's one that's 14 pounds per foot. Here's one that's 15, there's one that's 17 pounds per foot. To get anything lighter than that, you have to jump down to this one right here. So the table has been very carefully crafted to allow us to very rapidly find the lightest section. In other words, we don't have to worry about all of them. We can just go look at the ones that are in bold print. So you look at that one or that one or that one, but for the purposes of our class, you don't have to look at any of these. Now, you might want to know those are there, and you might want to scan over them if you're doing a real building, because you might have other important criteria, like you're trying to set up a module for the depth of all of your beams, or you have some kind of issue that has to do with coursing of concrete masonry or brick or whatever that might make you choose a depth that is not the most structurally efficient, but might conserve space in some way. But we don't know at this point what those criteria would be, so we're just going to find the lightest section. So we, here we have a 204 and we're looking for 207. So we're going to jump up to this 243, which is a W14 by 26. So now I'm going to go back and I see that we've put in a 14 by 26, which has a moment of inertia of 243 inches to the fourth. An important point here is that because of the quantum nature of the beams that are created, there's not an infinite number of them and there's not a continuum of them. We're looking at some fairly coarse numbers because we were targeting 207 and we're ending up with 243. In the end, that's generally not a sign that an enormous amount of material has been wasted because steel is overwhelmingly a very efficient material. But one advantage to this is that often when we size something and we have this big a gap, it means that we've got a margin of to work with in case something changes. Um, or in this case, it's just good to have a stiffer beam um, if in fact you can do that pretty cost effectively. And to be honest, this is an unbelievably light beam considering the length of the span and the loads that are supported. <clears throat> okay, so here we needed 274 inches to the fourth with a single loaded roof garter. We're going to go in our table and we're going to go look for that. And uh, I already forgot what it is. 724. So we're scrolling up here and we're getting a 375, 510. And I wanted to get to 724. And wow, here's a huge jump. We're at 612 and then we jump up to 847. And again, we can ignore all of these in between because they're all heavier. And when we get to 847, we're at a W21 by 44. 
So we're going to write 847W21 by 44. Finally here we need in a moment of inertia of 1449. So we go back to our table and we start scanning up and at the top of this we're at 1360 and then we wanted to get to 1449 but the next one up is 1560. So 1560 inches to the fourth for a W24 by 62. So we write 1560 for a 24 by 62. So now we have sized these beams for stiffness. And that's done. We can now move on. We don't have to look, look back or, or try to second guess any of that. We have that problem taken care of. What we need to take care of next is sizing for moment strength. Moment strength is going to be based on full factored load, including the self weight of the beam. So we could size the beam and just barely make find a beam that works and then the self weight of the beam might push it over the edge and not make it work. In which case we have to iterate and go to the next higher beam. <clears throat> it's pretty rare we have to do that because first of all these numbers are pretty good estimates of what the beam is going to be. And second of all, steel beams are so structurally efficient that their self-weight is not a significant part of the total load they're supporting. So typically, once we've sized for stiffness, and then we do one iteration on sizing for moment strength, we have accounted for everything we need to account for. But we'll talk about what happens when we get to that point. So now I'm going to scroll over in our spreadsheet. And I'm going to just keep these numbers right there. 26 pounds per foot, 44 pounds per foot, 62 pounds per foot, which was the outcome of our sizing for stiffness. And now we're going to size for moment strength. So we're going to have to account in all of this for, well, let's just, rather than read all this text, we'll go down and take some examples. We're looking for the factored load and we're looking for it in kips per foot. And on the joist, which was the first beam we dealt with, it's 1.2 times W imposed dead. So that's the 20 pounds a square foot of decking and insulation and ductwork and all those things plus 1.6 times w live where we said w live is 80 pounds a square foot and then it's got to be 1.2 times w self weight of the joist now we have a starting point right here for what the self weight might be we know it can't be less than that because it's got to be at least that for purposes of stiffness um, now what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to calculate this uh, whole thing here. But we're not going to base this W self on that number. So look where we've gone in terms of looking down the road. Here we're going to calculate a required moment in kip feet. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We're going to find a beam with that required moment. Um, in this case, it's 81 kip feet, so it's a perfect match to that. And that turns out to be a W10 by 19. And so this is the lightest section that satisfies our moment strength uh, requirement. For stiffness, we needed 26. For moment strength, we needed 19. So in this column, we're going to take the lightest acceptable section that works for both moment strength and stiffness. So this right here is actually the maximum of that number, M19, and this number, which is T19, which also happens to be 19 pounds per foot just by accident. And the larger of those two is 26. So one of the clever things about this spreadsheet is rather than go on and on doing these iterations and creating more of this spreadsheet, 
Um, I've just done the following. In this formula, I put x19. So x19 is the larger. That's this number right here. It's the larger of that and that. So something a little weird can happen. This is where I'm actually doing my iteration because I'm incorporating in this figure whatever that is. So before I size this for moment strength, I already had that number. If I put, if I size it for moment strength and this number ends up larger than that number, then that automatically updates this, which in turn redoes this calculation, which can change this number. And then we might discover if there's a significant enough effect there, we might have to iterate right here by finding a number, another number. But it almost never happens. So we're just going to be alert to it and watch it. So we have built into this whole system our iteration process, but it's almost never significant, as I said, because first of all, the self-weight of the beam is a small part of the total load, and second of all, we've already got a pretty good estimate for the self-weight, which is based on the stiffness over here. All right, so that's how we calculate um, the self-weight for the imposed dead load factored, the imposed live load factored, and the self-weight of the beam factored. Now we're going to come down here, and this gets more complicated. <clears throat> and in fact, I'm going to change this formula. I apologize for sort of Shifting horses in midstream, but I'm going to shift the order of that for the following reason. Um, that's the order in which I did the mathematics down below. So we say it's 1.2 W imposed, dead, 1.6 W live, um, oh, it's, <laughs> ah, I shouldn't be formatting in the middle of the lecture, but I'll do that. <clears throat> so it's uh, 1.2 times W self of the perimeter girder plus 1.2 W self of the joist on the perimeter girder. And What's tricky about this particular one is in the previous one, we did W self of the joist, and now we're doing W self of the perimeter girder. That's all very predictable. What's new here is we're adding W self of the joist on the perimeter girder. And the formula for this I've included here. And this is a little tricky, so pay attention. Uh, first of all, it's W of the joist, which was this number up here. And in this case, it's times half the length of the joist because it's a perimeter girder and the perimeter girder is only supporting half of one joist. So this is the total weight of the joist. It's the self-weight of the joist times the length of the joist. Now, there's a denominator here, and that comes from the following. This, is, this numerator is basically the point force that the joist is exerting on the girder. But that force only gets exerted, in this case, every six feet, which is the spacing of the joist. So if we want some kind of an equivalent distributed load as W in pounds or kips per foot, 
we need to take this point force and divide by the length over which it's exerted. So it only occurs every six feet, so each force can be imagined to be distributed over that six foot length. So when I go look at this formula, it's the classic 1.2 times the imposed dead plus 1.6 times the imposed live plus 1.2 times the self weight of the girder. And the self weight of the girder is this number right here. It's x22. And then I've divided by a thousand to make that into kips per foot instead of pounds per foot. And now this whole term right here is the load imposed by the self weight of the joists. And by the way, all this is, seems pretty messy, and it is pretty messy. One of the things you'll appreciate about the computer program that we're going to use is that a lot of this is automatically done. In other words, you just load the joists. You never have to figure out the load on the girders because the software accounts for the self-weight of all the members. But we're going to go through this so you understand what's involved. So relative to the girders, we have B19 over 2, which is the length of the joist divided by two, because only half of that joist is on a perimeter girder, times the self weight of the joist, which is this number right here, x19. And then of course we have to divide x19 by a thousand in order to get it into kips. And then <clears throat> we divide by c19 and that's off the screen, but that was the spacing of the joist, which uh, in this case turns out to be six feet. So we run all those numbers, we get this. Now the self-weight for the interior girder looks exactly the same, except we update all the cells to account for uh, the self-weight of the girder here, which is X25, so that's this cell right here. Uh, the B19 and the X19 remains the same, except we don't divide B19 by 2 because um, we're only supporting half of the length of the joist. So it's B19, the full length of the joist, times X19, which is the self-weight of the joist, divided by 1,000 to convert it to kips, and then divided by the 6 feet to account for how, how it's distributed over the length. So all of that got us this load on the joist, that load on the girders, on the perimeter girders, and this load on the interior girders. So then I calculate the moment that's required, which is WL squared over 8 for a simple span beam. And let's look at the arithmetic on that, because one of the warnings we gave you was Excel will not get the units correct for you. So we're going to run our formula and see what kind of conversion factors we have to include. So here we have the moment is WL squared over 8, where W is the total factored load. Uh, it turns out it's 0.367 for the case we're looking at in kips per foot, times the 42 feet squared divided by 8. This foot cancels out one of those feet, and we end up with kip feet. And this is one of those eureka moments when we say, thank goodness life is simple, because in this particular case, the result of the computation is automatically in the correct units for entering into the tables of moment capacity for wide flange beams. So no conversion factors have to be added to the computations in Excel. So we go back to Excel, and we're going to look at this formula right here. And it's just going to equal N19, which is this number right here, that's the load, times B19, times B19, B19 is the length of the joist, and then we have to divide by this 8 factor. And we came out with 81 in, uh, kip feet for the moment. Likewise, when we come here, um, it's very simple. It's exactly the same formula. It's this load times the length of the girder squared divided by 8, and we get 295 kip feet. And then this formula, again, is just updated 
to have all the data for the perimeter girder, but it's the load times the length squared over eight. So now we want to be able to go into these tables and find something with this moment capacity. So we have three tables that we can choose from. These are the heavy ones. Um, these are the lighter ones. And by the way, I just did something wrong here. Okay, so you're back in the field of view. These are the heaviest ones. These are the lighter ones. And I don't know why my PowerPoint keeps moving around like this, but. And then these are the lightest. Now, this table is not ideally organized for what we're doing, but it's okay. Here we have a shape starting at the lightest and going to heavier. Again, they're grouped where in this group, the bold one at the top is the lightest one, which also is stronger than the one below it. This one is shallower and because it's shallower, it's weaker um, and it weighs more. And you might say, well, why would anybody do that? And the answer is, well, you might want a 12 inch deep beam instead of a 16 inch deep beam. And you might have some really good architectural reason for that. Okay. So, the important column now is not neither of these. We've done I already, and for the moment we're not even talking about what Z is. So um, we're looking at, this is the design moment. And by the way, it already has the resistance factor built into it. So it is the allowed or design moment for the beam in question. So 47.3 kip feet is the design moment for this beam. Now we said we are looking for 81. So we're going to start to scan up here and here we see 81. And that's a W10 by 19. And it makes us nervous because we're thinking, well, 81 is just barely what we need. And when we if we have to size this beam up for strength, then we might push ourselves over the edge, in which case we might have to look for the next one up. But before we jump off that bridge, we're going to write 81 kip feet in our spreadsheet for a W10 by 9, and we end up with 81 by W10 by 19, excuse me. Now, notice this. Over here, we said the maximum of that and that. Well, this is the largest of those two numbers. So what this says is stiffness has forced us to come up with a stronger beam than moment strength. This thing is already updated to account for that. In fact, it was always able to account for that because we sized this before we went on to doing any of this. So it turns out that that one, which was just right, this 81, um, is still fine because we didn't upsize the beam and it has more than enough strength to handle its own self weight. Here we wanted something with 295 kip feet. Um, we need to go into the table so we're looking for 295. We can't find it anywhere in here because this stops at 203. So we come scanning up here looking for 295, 295, and whoa, look at this. We came to 294, and most people would say the difference between 294 and 295, given what we're able to quantify about our buildings, is negligible. But most architects and engineers will tell you, don't do that, because if anything goes wrong with the building, the opposing lawyers will cite over and over again that you cut a corner here. And you can argue all you want that it's within any kind of reasonable margin of error, but just do it right. Jump up to 359 for a W21 by 40. So that's what we wrote. 359 kip feet for a W21 by 40. We got a W21 by 40 from stiffness. We got the same thing from moment. And so this is the final answer. 
this is the max of that and that, and they're both equal, so the max is equal to what they are equal to. So now we have uh, 585. We're going to go look for something with 585 kip feet, so kip feet of a t capacity. So we're scrolling up here in our moment column, and this doesn't work, but that does. So 600 kip feet for a W21 by 68. So we go here, 600 kip feet, 21 by 68. Now here's something really interesting. We got a 68 required for strength, 62 was required for stiffness. So what's controlling the design is strength. And this number over here is ending up equal to that because that's the larger of the two. So here's an interesting pattern. This lightly loaded roof joist is controlled by stiffness, not strength. For the intermediate load of a perimeter girder, the two are producing the same beam. And then for the more heavily loaded girder, the interior girder, we only needed a 62 pound beam for stiffness. We needed 68 for strength. The beauty is this automatically inputs 68, which is the maximum of the two numbers. That number is automatically included in here. So you'll see we have um, X25 right there. So we know this number was automatically updated when that got put in. And now we can look at this required moment of inertia, which is based on this updated weight. And we see this is still larger than that. So we don't actually have to go through the iteration because it's already been done for us. Okay, so that sets up how you're going to go about doing this assignment. Now I'm going to scroll down a little bit. And I'm going to let you see what the rest of this spreadsheet looks like. So we got floor joist, single loaded floor girder, double loaded floor girder. I've already input the, all these numbers the way they ought to be. Um, so what we're going to ask you to do, and by the way, this number is slightly different, as I said, between what you've been compared to what you've been using so far, but that's a good number for sizing the floor of an office space. And I'm going to ask you to fill in the formulas here. So I put in this formula and that one and that one, but I'm going to ask you to put in those three. And then you're also going to select the members that have an adequate moment of inertia. You're going to write in the depth and the weight per foot here. And then you're also going to do the strength analysis. So you're going to fill in the appropriate formula for this and the appropriate formula for that and the appropriate formula for that. You'll fill in these three formulas. You'll select beams, the least heavy beam that gives you an adequate moment capacity. And then you'll fill in the depths and you'll fill in the weights and you'll check to make sure that um, when the value here is updated to uh, account for whatever this final weight is, that in fact the beam still works. So that ends this assignment. You're going to be given this spreadsheet. You're going to fill in uh, the formulas and you're going to hold on to a copy of that because it's a template for working other problems in the future. But you're also going to be given some questions on looking at patterns. And one of the patterns I already pointed out was these lightly loaded roof joists are governed by stiffness. The heavily loaded floor girders are governed by moment strength.